Uh, my wife Elizabeth sends her greetings to you. And uh, we do have uh, fond memories of commission because uh, uh, we were part and parcel of the very first commission in 1987. As, uh, 1988, I think it was 88. The uh, second one was uh, 91, 1988, uh, which we pioneered and I was directing. And I remember uh, a phrase that we used to say as we came to the conclusion of that commission. We had this phrase that we would quote, uh, that we, the organizers of commission, will not take responsibility for what will happen to you in this conference. It does not mean we were careless, but it simply meant we were uh, stepping aside and allowing God to take the whole responsibility over whatever would happen and take place in the life of every single individual who had attended the commission. And uh, allow me to mention that phrase now as we come towards the conclusion of uh, our commission uh, 2021, that the Lord God himself will take responsibility over what is going to happen to your life as you make decisions concerning the future. Because a number of people who did make those decisions, years afterwards, the decision that they made at one or other commission still followed them and carried them on and affected their lives permanently. They could no longer remain the same. And that is why we have the boldness to say the Lord God himself will take responsibility over your life as you make a serious decision for him today. I was requested to share with us on the subject of faithful witness in a dynamic world. And kindly turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 24 verse 36 through verse 49. A passage that I was also given. And let me just look at it and glean some insights for our reflection as we go through this process. Some of you perhaps have come to that situation where it is very clear in your mind what the Lord would want to do with your life. Some of you still are groping, wondering what is it that the Lord may be saying to me as an individual. Some of you may have come to that point where you are actually wrestling with God. You know what he's saying, but perhaps your heart doesn't want to go that direction. It is our prayer that the Holy Spirit of God would tip the balance today so that as an individual you come to that point of following the wooing and the leading of the Lord in the direction that he would want you to go. Luke chapter 24 verse verse 36 through verse uh, 49. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the songs concerning me. And he opened their, ma their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry uh, in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. Speak, Lord, your servants listen. Open our eyes that we may see wondrous things out of your law. 
May the meditation of our hearts and the words of our mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a world that is dynamic, a world that is rapidly changing, a world that is not constant at all. Changes in the world have left us more or less like toothless bulldogs. And no wonder the renowned church researcher, George Banner, declares, there is a great deal of disagreements among sociologists, but they agree that change is happening faster today than ever before. Our uh, culture is reinventing itself every three to five years. We are having new patterns of behavior two or three times per decade. We must be innovative in the church because of the changes that are taking place. The renowned management guru Peter Drucker puts it this way in his book, Post-Capitalist Society. Every few hundred years in Western history, there occurs a sharp transformation within a few short decades. Society rearranges itself, its worldviews, its basic values, its social and political structures, its arts, its key institutions. Fifty years later, there is a new world and the people born then cannot even imagine the world in which their grandparents lived and into which they were born. Imagine someone who fell asleep 20 years ago. Imagine that person waking up today after 20 years of sleeping. What are some of the changes that that individual will be able to see? The technological revolution that has taken place in our world today. The globalization and cultural shifts that are taking place across the entire world to the extent the world has become a small village. The economic migrations and diaspora and forced migrations. The reality of youth culture and youth unemployment. The pluralism and competing views for beliefs among the people. The rise of terrorism and insurgency. As a matter of fact, a number of uh, a couple of years ago, I went to a country and there was no frisking when people are entering the church. I was so shocked. You mean there is still a country where people can enter church without being searched? The resurgence of atheism, the soft and uh, persecution of uh, uh, Christians. Modernity and postmodernity and post postmodernity. The return to African traditional religion when we look at Africa. The way we do school has changed. The way we do business has changed. The way we do church has changed. Even the way we do conferences has also changed, as we can see from here. Changes are taking place right across the world. We live in a world that is dynamic, a world that is changing. As a matter of fact, these changes have not leave, left the church the same. They have brought even greater transformation in the church. We have seen churches in Western Europe turned into museum. Some of them have been converted into bars while others have simply closed down because no one is attending church anymore in some of these places. Statistics from the UK show us that secularization is much faster than we had actually imagined a population that was identified uh, of those who had no religion rose from 25% in 2011 to 48% of the population of UK in 2014. Now, Kiona Mwenza Kokinyolewa, Nawe Tia Kijuamaji. When you begin to see some of these things going on in the Western world, generally they say it takes about 7 to 14 years before it hits us as well in the so-called the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Southern world. The Japanese built a bridge over the river Choluteca in Honduras. It was a strong bridge. It was a beautiful bridge. And then in 1987, Hurricane Mitch blew over Honduras, bringing about great destruction in that nation. But a strange thing happened. The bridge was never destroyed by the hurricane. It remained as strong as ever. 
But there was only one difference. The river had changed its course. Instead of passing under the bridge, the river was passing about a kilometer away, leaving the bridge where it was. It was strong, it was firm, but the river had changed its course. Similarly, as we move on among students and among Christians and in our churches and in our nations, there were some things that are strong, some things that we valued, but the world has changed because the world is dynamic. There were days we used to do evangelism and some things were effective, but the world has changed. There were ways in which we engaged in ministry at some point, but the river has changed its course. We can still boast about the bridge, but the bridge is no longer useful because we live in a dynamic world where the river has changed its course and we as individual have got to begin thinking how do we begin to engage in a world that is dynamic a world that is changing Helma Tielke wrote and said the gospel must constantly be forwarded to a new address because the recipient is repeatedly changing his place of residence the gospel must be forwarded to a new address because the recipient is repeatedly changing his place of residence. And it is my belief that the Lord is inviting us as individuals who live in this generation to begin engaging this ever constantly moving residence with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in a manner that will be able to penetrate their hearts and allow them to hear what the Lord is actually saying to them. The book of Luke uh, chapter 24 gives us scenarios of post-resurrection revelation of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The final one listed for us is the incident when the frightened disciples were gathered together in a locked room. And uh, this is the passage that we read a little while ago. Allow me then just to bring a few highlights for our reflection from this passage that I think are pertinent to us in addressing the subject a faithful witness in a dynamic world, a world that is constantly changing. First of all, the call to be a minister or a witness in a dynamic world. Verse 36 through verse 40 and verse 48 points out to us it is interesting to note that when Jesus appeared to the disciples they were locked up and cowering in fear in a room. We are told in this passage that some of them did not believe that he had been raised up from the dead when they saw him. As a matter of fact, Luke is very kind to them. When we read the same narratives from the book of Mark, Mark is rather unkind to them. Mark chapter 16 verse 5, they were frightened. Mark 16 verse 7, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mark 16 verse 11, when they had when they heard that he was alive and was seen by, by her, they did not believe it. Mark 16 verse 13, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Mark 16 verse 14, he reprimanded them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Here are a bunch of unbelieving believers. Individuals who are meant to be the propagators and the witnesses of the resurrection are individuals who actually are not believing even in the resurrection. Yet immediately after, the, uh, uh, after this, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ turns to them and gave them the great commission that is recorded to all of us uh, in the five gospel. If I look, uh, vol if I include volume two of the book of uh, uh, the book of Luke as well, the book of Acts. Uh, recorded in all the five Gospels, telling us that he gave them a commission to go out and preach and proclaim the Gospel. How can you send unbelieving believers to go and preach? When Jesus Christ issued the Great Commission to a bunch of cowering and doubtful disciples, it appeared like the task of world evangelization was going to be a non-starter. 
But the 11 disciples together with their later recruits went everywhere preaching the word of the Lord to the extent that the then known world was reached by the gospel. By the year 100 AD, the gospel had been carried to the whole of the Roman Empire to the extent that it is estimated there were more than a half a million Christians in the then known world. And believing believers. They stood where we stand. They stood in a place where they felt disqualified. They stood in a place where they struggled with their faith and they struggled with issues of conviction. They may have felt disqualified for whatever reason, but you see the Lord qualifies the unqualified and picks them up and gives them a call and points to them and declares, you are my witnesses. Did he recognize the fact that they were doubting? Yes, he did, but still you are my witnesses. Did he recognize the fact that they were frightened and afraid? Yes, he did. But still, you are my witnesses. Did he recognize the fact that they were unbelievers? Yes, he did. But still, you are my witnesses. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, young and old alike, may I put it to you that the Lord Jesus Christ looks at the potential within you. What his grace can make of you when you surrender yourself and let yourself go. And he picks up the unqualified and he qualifies them to the extent he makes them witnesses that transforms the entire world for the sake of his gospel. You are my witnesses. This is the expectation that is placed upon us as Christians that we may identify with him. There is no room for anonymous Christians. The call he places upon our lives is to be contagious Christians who are bringing a change to our world. We are meant to gossip about the kingdom of God to our neighbors, to our relatives, to our friends, to our colleagues, and to anyone sundry who would be able or to listen to us. We have come to the conclusion as we look at some of the things that are going on in some the third, fourth generation Christian in Kenya, that a number of us are growing up without the ability and lacking the knowledge to even know how to share our faith with non-Christians. We can discuss Manchester United and Arsenal, but not Jesus Christ. We can discuss the politics of our countries and our nations, but not the issues of our faith. We can discuss the hairstyle and the latest uh, dress models that we know of, but not our faith. We can discuss matters con concerning food, school fees, education, but our mouths are shut when it comes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are witnesses. Dr. Stephen Nail, a one-time professor at Nairobi University who later on became a bishop in uh, the UK, wrote and said concerning the early church, what is clear is that every Christian was a witness. Where there were Christians, there would be a living, burning faith and before long, an expanding Christian community. What will it take for you to be a witness? It will take a personal experience with God. It will take maintaining a vibrant relationship with God. It may take hearing the call of God and hearing him whisper in your heart. It may take cultivating a vision for mission that God does actually want to use you regardless of your weaknesses, of your failures, of your inadequacies, of feelings of being unqualified. He is the one who would want to qualify you. I think it was the year 1986 or perhaps 85 as a young student at Kenyatta University that I went on board a ship in Mombasa with I think five other individuals, four other individuals from Kenya, a ship owned by Operation Mobilization called Dulos had docked in Mombasa. And we went to help in doing evangelism in Mombasa at that particular time. One of the evenings on the ship, they showed us 
a movie, a clip, a video of the needs of the world and how they were lacking in terms of the gospel. Something touched my heart. I began to weep on that ship. I bought a map of the world and went to my room back in college, pinned it on the wall of my room, and I bought 70 cards for 70 needy nations, and I would begin to pray for these nations one by one, these nations one by one, committing them to the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, I've not been to all those nations, but I've been to quite a number of those nations. Not only that, the Lord himself allowed me to the extent I've been on that ship again and again, preaching, spending time there. I'm even on board of Operation Mobile at that particular time. But what happened to me on that ship? I got a vision, a vision of the world, a vision of the needs of the world, a vision of what God can do through you, through me, a vision that regardless I was only a student, yet God can use a student, plant something in your heart that 30, 40 years onwards is still going on because you caught a vision as a student. It is that great missionary evangelist to Latin America, Kenneth Strachan, who emphasized on the centrality of a community of God's people that he called the church. He said, no matter how poor, no matter how ignorant, no matter how talentless the local congregation may be, it is the body of Christ in that local locality. In it dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It is endured with all the responsibilities of the Christian church and with all the capabilities of fulfilling those responsibilities. No matter how poor, no matter how talentless, no matter how ignorant, it is still the body of Christ. What is this man saying? This man is saying, God's got you. You are all that God has. You are the one that he's looking for. You are the one that he wants to engage. God's got you. You may be feeling you are poor. You may be feeling you are talentless. You may be feeling you do not have what it takes. But this man is saying, you've got all the responsibility of taking the gospel. And you've got all the capability to be able to take that gospel as well. For the glory and the honor of God. Secondly, the predicament in witnessing. I'll rush through some of these so that I'll cover them quickly. Some predicament. Verse 47 says this, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This is repeated in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Lord gave them the mandate, the mandate to take his word to all the nations. The word used there is a word from which we get our English word ethnic groups, in other words, people groups, meaning communities and people groups. The scope of their witnessing was the whole world. There was no country where their voice should not be heard. There was no community where people should not bend down their knees before the throne of God. There was no language where this proclamation should be heard, should not be heard. And the book of Acts in a concentric circle, begins to give to us the progression of this gospel, beginning in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They were to take the gospel to all the nations, to all the peoples, to people of other faiths and to people of no faiths. They were to take the gospel to all. This required them to step out and move counterculture in an env environment that was extremely hostile to their claims. 
in spite of the pressure to conform and in spite of the persecution that they were experiencing, they adamantly refused to give way and to cave in, continuing to insist that the Lord Jesus Christ was the way to repentance and the way to, submit, to, to remission of sin, that there was no other way except the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a world that is becoming extremely hostile to our faith and Christianity. Even in countries which formerly were considered majority Christian world, it has become politically incorrect to talk about your faith, live alone to attempt to convert someone else. We are experiencing what someone has called the gagging of the gospel. The change that has moved our society from a communal society to a more individualistic society has even contributed much more to this. Jesus Christ now is my personal savior. And he is so personal that he cannot be shared with anyone else. It is viewed as if if you are interfering with someone's privacy by attempting to share with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Charles Colson, a one-time associate of President Nixon, who was jailed for the Watergate affair, but became born again just before going into prison, writes these words, privately practice religion is, I suppose, still acceptable. But come out of your prayer closet and voice an opinion informed by religious values and representatives of the liberal elite in our nations, educators, media moguls, attorneys, politicians, and civil liberty groups will have you for lunch. It's okay as long as you remain private but come out and express the private faith that you have ah the disciples cowering in their rooms again and yet they have been told witnesses to the whole world that's the predicament that we have a mandate that we have been given to go out into the whole world and yet a world that does not want to hear and listen to our message it is a world that we must confront with this message whether they want to hear it or not through the various means that God has put in, uh, in our, uh, at our disposal so that they may be able to engage with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ thirdly the barriers to witnessing in this dynamic world verse 44 and 45 says that uh, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me and he opened their uh, understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures the disciples were facing barriers of internal fear, barriers of unbelief and doubt, but they also were facing barriers of understanding the gospel, the proclamation of this which had been spoken before. Not only did he rebuke their unbelief, but he also opened their minds so that they would understand the gospel. He informed them that his life was a fulfillment of the prophetic words which had been spoken by Moses, the prophets, and even in the Psalms. He challenged them that now he was opening their minds so that they could be able to connect the dots, the dots that were pertaining to the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the dots that were touching on the things that the prophets, the things that Moses had spoken in the law. Thus, they were able to understand, aha, this is what the gospel means. Repentance should be preached and remission of sins should be preached. Ladies and gentlemen, the brand of Christianity among some of us is what I would call moralistic, therapeutic deism. It is a brand of Christianity that is a mutant form of the original Christianity. It is a watered down faith that portrays God as a divine therapist whose chief goal is to boost people's self-esteem. Many parents, many pastors, many individuals, many youth workers are giving out this kind of Christianity to people. Watered down kind of Christianity. 
It is an imposter faith, a strain of Christianity that unwittingly sometimes we are passed on, which we should not pass on at all. It is a gospel that does not uh, bring in the death and the resurrection and the transforming power that comes as a result of repentance in this gospel. It is the message that we have, not the newspapers, not the constitution of our countries. It is the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is this message that you and I have been invited to propagate as well to our needy ones. But what do these people believe? Although some people believe that God exists. Although they believe that God wants people not to be saved. People to be nice. And so we have a gospel of niceness. Where faith is simply doing good. And not ruffling the feathers. The Christians call to risk, to witness, to sacrifice is muted and not hard at all because we want to be nice. But oh, that God may give us a passion, a passion that would bring tears to our eyes, a passion that would propel us forward regardless of what everyone else is saying out there, a passion that would say, I now know the truth. There is a transforming power in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that God may give us the gift of tears. Oh, that he may give us broken hearts, bended knees, and wet eyes as we go before him. As Henry Jowett wrote once and said, the gospel of a broken heart demands the ministry of bleeding hearts. As soon as we cease to bleed, we cease to bless. We can never heal the needs we do not feel. Tearless hearts can never be the heralds of the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tearless hearts can never be the passions of the herald of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been invited and given a message. Fourth thing I want to mention to us is that there are possibilities in witnessing that are ahead of us. Verse 47 and 49. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in, at Jerusalem. And verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. The disciples having seen Jesus Christ who had started this great revolution, rise up from the dead, were overexcited. Wouldn't it have been their desire that they would go out there and immediately begin to proclaim the gospel to people? And yet the Lord himself kind of tells them, wait a little bit, there's something better coming. I will actually bring the Holy Spirit upon you who will endure you so that when you go out, beginning at Jerusalem, you will be able to preach this message of repentance and remission of sin because of what I will have put upon you. In other words, there are great possibilities Abilities for witnessing in a manner that would honor the Lord and a manner that is empowered by the Lord. So regardless of who we are, we can plug in into his resources and as a result of that, be able to proclaim the message that he would want us to proclaim. It is Elizabeth Barnett Browning who wrote and said, Art is crammed with heaven and every common bush aflame with God. But only those who see take off their shoes. The rest sit around, around it and pluck blackberries. Those who see the bushes burning by fire. They will remove their shoes. For they know I am standing on holy ground. But there are others who will not see the bushes burning by fire. They will just sit around the bushes and pluck blackberries, not seeing the opportunities that are around about them that God is presenting. There are possibilities of witnessing through our character, living lives that will actually reflect to individuals that as they watch us, as they look at us, they will begin to wonder, how come this person is living like this? This person is living such a different lifestyle. 
character-based life. And character-based life demands that actually we be authentic, we be genuine. If you are in a matatu and someone is selling a shampoo and he comes and he says, shampoo, shampoo, shampoo. If you use this one here, your hair will grow overnight. And you look at the individual and he's bald-headed. <laughs> if you're like me, you'll ask him a question. <laughs> if it is so useful, how come it has not helped you? You see, if the gospel is not good enough for local consumption, it is not good enough for export. If it has not helped and transformed us, our character and changed us, we cannot have the moral authority to proclaim the same gospel elsewhere. It's got to transform us and change us. Our lives become lives of witnessing when we have been transformed by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we proclaim it to the rest. There are opportunities for using our words, whether in personal conversations or in proclamation or preaching. As Jesus told them here, this gospel must be preached. There are those opportunities for us to preach it out. It is St. Francis of a city who is reputed to have said, preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. There is possibility of witnessing through the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. That when the Holy Spirit has, has, has come upon us, we can go out there, particularly when we are dealing with the people of other faiths. And trust God to come through through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through miraculous gifts, the supernatural gifts of God. I'm amazed that there are some individuals who are still saying that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were passed Trusting God to move and bring about a touch and a change in the lives of individuals, including in bringing healing. There is possibility of expressions of compassion as an avenue of witnessing, reaching out to people who are needy, meeting with their needs, expressing the love of Christ to them through compassion. There is possibility of using polemics or apologetics in order to defend the faith, coming before the Lord and being able to debate and engage others through the gospel. There is possibility of becoming internet evangelist using the blogs, WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram. All these are possibilities of witnessing that the Lord is laying before us. Let's use them. As a young Christian student at Kenyatta University, those days there was a bus that was called KBS Kenya Bus that would come and its last destination was Kenyatta University. And then it would turn. And a number of us would get into this bus and even in the bus, we would begin witnessing. Those were different days. Unlike today where you go into the buses and it is written. No smoking. No hawking. No preaching. A friend of mine who is well known here in this city, if I mention his name, you know him, who was a colleague of mine at, uh, in the university of Yermitz. Would go and pick the telephone booth. Some of you may know telephone booths. And he would just press a number. There's got to be someone at the other end. Surely. How can it be vacant? And someone would pick it off at the other end. And he would say, hey, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And we'd sit down with someone in a bus. And you'd turn to them and you say, hey, are we going to the same place? And they would ask, it depends where you are going. And you'd say, I'm headed to heaven. How about you? <sighs> the possibilities are numerous of how the Lord can use us in order to witness and share out with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is the renowned theologian and former chaplain of the Queen of England, Dr. John Stott, who wrote and said, Another context of witness is the workplace. For it is here that most Christians spend half their working, waking hours. And work is divine calling. Christians can commend Christ by word of mouth, by their consistent industry, honesty, and thoughtfulness, by their concerns for justice in the workplace, and especially if others can see from the quality of their daily work that it is done for the glory of God. Witnessing in the marketplace. So whether you plan to be a doctor, whether you are a lawyer, whether you are planning to be an engineer, that God, yes, may call some of you directly to be engaged in missionary career missions, but some of you that wherever you are, that he would want to use you as a witness for the glory and the honor of his name. I close with the last one, the price and reward of missions. Verse 46 is a painful verse. Then he said to them, It is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ was an indication that the gospel often will have a price tag on it. Indeed, we can sing that Jesus paid it all. And so he did. He paid it all for us. The pardon for our sins. Jesus paid it all. But taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ from one place to another place is still a very costly venture. The futurist consultant Tom Sign wrote, we talk about the Lordship of Christ, but our career comes faster. Our house in the suburbs comes faster. Upscaling our lives comes faster. Then whatever is left, we try to follow Jesus Christ with what is left. Jesus calls us to be willing to lay down our lives for his sake. Jesus calls us to determine that we will step out and obey him. This may radically affect us. It may affect, bring vocational insecurity in our lives. It may affect us in terms of our family. family. It may affect our finances. It may affect our physical security. It may affect our social security. It will affect everything Jesus said. What does it mean? It means if I am going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I be prepared to pay the price and give in to the consequence of what you want me to follow. Basilia Schlink has written, The age of St. Stephen has dawned. In other words, we have not only entered the age of horror, darkness, persecution, torture, and martyrdom, but like Stephen whose face was radiant because he saw the open heavens, God's God's children turn their eyes towards heaven, then heavens open and shines upon them. The Lord is inviting you and I to be open to him. The Moravian missionaries started early by Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf in Switzerland became a movement that was bringing great changes. And during this period of time, they would go out somewhere in South Africa there was a, 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 a leprosy village that they could see from the top of the hill. One Moravian would go in and those days if you interacted with the leprous people you would not come out. It had only one entry because they looked out and they saw one leprous person who had no hand but had feet. He was carrying a person who had hands but had no feet. And the person who had hands but had no feet was dropping maize and the other one was burying them with his feet on the soil as they planted. And the Moravian said go in there and one would go when the person who has gone in contracted leprosy. Another person would go in. He would wave a flag and the people on top of the hill would see another person would go in to take his place. Ladies and gentlemen the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is costly. What is your response to the call that he has placed upon your life to be a witness? If this open letter was yours what would be your response? Dear Christian I have been authorized by God to give you this message. Music ministry, you want to join me here? You are to go to all people everywhere and call them to become my disciples. You are to baptize them and teach them to observe 
all that I have commanded you. Don't forget, I will always be there to help you, even to the end of the world. I will never forsake you because I love you. Please don't forsake me. With all my love, Jesus Christ. That is a letter from the Lord Jesus. What would be your response? Perhaps for some of us, we would say this. Dear Jesus Christ, we acknowledge receipt of your memo. Your proposal is both interesting and challenging. However, due to shortage of personnel, as well as several other financial and personal obligations, we do not feel that we can give proper emphasis to your challenge at this time. A committee has been appointed to study the plan and its, its feasibility. We should have a report to bring to our community, our congregation, our CU sometimes in the future. You may rest assured that we will give this our careful consideration and our boards will think about it for some future action. We appreciate your offer to serve as our resource person and should we care to undertake this project sometime later, we will be in contact with you cordially, the Christian. If he's inviting you to be a witness, what is your response? You want to help us? You got the song or I give you the song? I surrender all to you, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. You know it? Yes. Come on. Please just sing it briefly for us. us online, you've been following the sermon, just make that commitment to the Lord. What is your response to God? He's inviting you to be a witness in this dynamically changing world. What is your response to him? Are you going to tell him, Lord, here am I. Here am I, Lord. Use me the way you want to use me. I avail myself. I'm withholding nothing to you. I surrender all to you. Just whisper it to him. Just whisper it to him. Tell him, I want to give my all to you, Lord. I want to give my all to you. Just whisper it to him and just let him take over. Let him take control of your life right now. 
We're just going to pray with categories of people as we commend and commit ourselves into the hands of the Lord right now. There are a number of us here, first of all, people in whose hearts the Lord has laid a very specific call to be engaged in career missionary work. Whether using your career or going out through uh, 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 as a missionary into a different cultural setting. You sense deeply in your heart the Lord is laying this burden. You need to be a missionary using either your career or going out as a career missionary worker where the Lord is laying you, uh, laying your heart upon. If that is you, raise your hands. Perhaps you are sensing that but you still don't know where you are going. You're sensing, yes, that's what I'm feeling in my heart. God would want to use me as a career missionary to be engaged with people of other cultures, to be involved in other nations to be involved with people communities that are different from me if that is you i want you to raise up your hand right now i want to bring me before the lord even where you are watching online also you can join us as you lift your hand before the lord just raise it up before the lord i'm going to make a prayer for you our father and our god look and behold your children whose hands are raised up Acknowledging the fact that you are the Lord of the universe, the Lord of the peoples, and the Lord who sends us to different ethnos and different peoples. I want to raise them before you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You who have placed that call upon their lives. I pray that today would mark a significant new beginning in their lives. That years to come, five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years to come, the decision that they are making right now would still be carrying on in their lives even in days to come for the glory and the honor of your name. I pray that you may give them a deep impression upon their heart. Those who are with us here in the in person, those who are watching online, that our God, you are the one who is calling them. So lay your hand upon them. Lay your hand upon them in the name of Jesus. Affirm to them in the name of Jesus that it is you who is speaking to them and directing them and ministering to their hearts. May you be honored and may you be glorified. Thank you, our Father and our Redeemer. We commend them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Secondly, we'd like to pray with those who sense the Lord is leading me into my profession. The Lord is leading me into a career. And in this career, perhaps he wants me to make money to support mission he wants me to serve in the marketplace where the Lord is leading me. I'm, I'm going to go through my schooling. I'm going to go into my career. But I'm going to consider my career, my place of work, as where the Lord is leading me as my mission field. And I'm going to make money to also serve the Lord. I'm going to be engaged in praying for the ministry of the Lord. you sensing that in your hand. Can you also raise your hand right now? I want to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our Father and our God, we thank you for our brothers and our sisters whose hands are lifted up responding to you as they sense that their mission field is the career that you are calling them to. And I pray that in that mission field, they would go in using all the gifts of marketplace ministry that would enable them to bring transformation in the marketplace where you have called them to. May they be witnesses for you in the marketplace who will be used to bring transformation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I commend them into your hands, Lord, praying that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would come upon them, that you would use them powerfully, that, Lord, through them there would be change agents in those institutions that perhaps would impact the nation, would impact the world because of what you are doing in their lives and through their lives. So take over their lives. We commend them to you now as we pray, even trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you very much and the Lord bless you. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Before we sit down, I'd like us to continue. Thank you so much uh, for that great time, that word. We want to sing the thing song again. Even as we are feeling this calling upon our lives, whether to